Where did D.B. Cooper really jump? Let's get on it. All right, friends, let's talk about where D.B. Cooper really jumps. So uh, for anybody who's been involved with or has watched this case or read about this case for any period of time, they're going to understand that there is a big sort of controversy in the D.B. Cooper world. And this relates to where D.B. Cooper jumped and it really goes a little bit further than that actually. It actually relates to the specific flight path that the jet actually flew at a very specific part of the journey from Seattle down to Reno. And there are basically two different versions of the flight path, slightly different in this one particular area. So I'm gonna throw up a map here to show you what I'm talking about here. Okay, so we've got this very famous yellow map here. Now you'll see that there's that dark line that dark gray or black line, it's a little bit squiggly, and it's labeled the FBI flight path. That is the path that the FBI believes that the airliner flew, Flight 305 flew, as it was uh, heading south from Seattle, approaching the Portland, Oregon area, and then uh, flying over Portland and proceeding south, ultimately, to Reno. How this flight path was constructed was a couple of days after the, the skyjacking took place, the Air Force, the United States Air Force, was tasked with crunching radar data and a variety of information and, and uh, basically uh, crunching all this data and reconstructing the, the flight path. So it's not like things are today where you kind of, you know, just kind of push rewind on the radar screen and there's a nice little blip that kind of just shows the the path that the flight, the, the path that the jet took, it's much more complicated. It's a matter of crunching data and so forth. And ultimately that's what they came up with, the FBI flight path there. You'll notice there's one other line there that's called uh, this, this blue and it's labeled the Western flight path. That's the theorized flight path that I believe the jet actually flew. And a couple of things that are worth noting, you'll see that on the FBI flight path, there's a spot that uh, notes or denotes uh, where the FBI believes that D.B. Cooper jumped. And obviously their search area, the area that they searched was based upon their assumption that he jumped near that spot on the FBI flight path. Importantly, after nearly 51 years, they have found a grand total of zilch. Absolutely nothing at all in that area to indicate that D.B. Cooper was ever there. Now, once again, you'll note on the Western flight path line, the blue line, there's a spot that denotes the money find spot. This is the spot where eight years after the skyjacking, a portion of D.B. Cooper's money, about $6,000, was found buried in the sand along the Columbia River. Now, the very big problem is there is no rational explanation for how the money ended up buried in the sand along the Columbia River if the FBI flight path is correct and if D.B. Cooper jumped where they believe he jumped. The distance is a good, you know, 15, 20 miles as the crow flies and there is no rational explanation for how the money ended up there if the FBI flight path is correct. So that is part of the reason why I tend to believe that the FBI flight path is actually incorrect and that the Western flight path is actually the actual path that the jet took. And you can see the Western flight path essentially flies literally right over the spot where the money was found. So let's get into it a little bit here. So uh, over the next few videos, I'm gonna try to slowly uh, explain what I call the anatomy of a mistake here. I'm going to try to solely explain what I think what what went wrong uh, and ultimately uh, explains how some mistakes and errors were made on, the, on behalf of certain officials and certain people that ultimately led uh, the FBI, the Air Force, and by virtue of the Air Force, the FBI, to mark out, pencil out, uh, identify an incorrect flight path. And I think that has a lot to do with D.B. Cooper getting away because obviously if the guy landed, you know, 20 miles from where they think he landed, well, he's got a little bit of an advantage there because they're just looking in the wrong spot. So 
All right, so this is gonna get a little bit technical here, so try to be clear and try to not like burden you with too much technical information, but here we go. So the jet took off from Seattle, and when it took off from Seattle, it was initially in a sector, an air space sector called Sector 2. And Sector 2 is airspace, basically, that goes from ground level up to essentially 10,000 feet. And while the jet is in that airspace, there is a specific radar man who communicates with the airliner. And this radar man is known as Radar Man 2 because he's controlling Sector 2 airspace. Now, once the jet transitions above 10,000 feet, which is what normally would happen for an airliner, then Radar Man 2 would contact the pilots and give them a new frequency then, and tell them to contact the individual who's controlling the sector, the airspace, the sector airspace that the jet is now flying into or heading into above 10,000 feet. So what happens here is the jet takes off as noted there, but there's a little bit of a glitch here. The jet doesn't fly a normal pattern. It doesn't fly up to a normal cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. So right off the bat, things are very different with the way this jet needs to be handled. And it caused some confusion, and you'll see how in just a second here. Uh, the jet was tasked by D.B. Cooper, was ordered by D.B. Cooper not to exceed 10,000 feet in altitude, which happens to be that bright line between the two sectors, the lower space airspace sector and the sector of airspace just above that, which goes from 10,000 feet up to 24,000 feet. And then there's also uh, a sector of airspace that goes from 24,000 feet and above. So what happens here? is the jet's flying south and it approaches an area called Toledo, Washington. And it's at that point where R2, Radar Man 2, again controlling Sector 2 airspace, contacts the pilots and notifies them, uh, gives them a new frequency and notifies them and tells them to contact the frequency to talk to the new air traffic controller who is going to be handling their jet. Now, the person, Radar Man 2, R2, made a mistake. He gave the pilots the wrong frequency. And we know this with certainty because the frequency is actually quoted in the transcripts, the actual transcripts between air traffic control and the airliner. What R2 mistakenly did is gave the pilots the frequency for Sector 16 airspace, Sector 16 airspace. Now, Sector 16 airspace is airspace, airspace that goes from uh, 24,000 feet and above. So for some odd reason, the air traffic controller, R2, made a mistake and sent the pilots of the Skyjacked airliner to R-16, again, the radar man controlling Sector 16 airspace, which is 24,000 feet or above. This happened at precisely 7.59 and 15 seconds p.m. 7.59 and 15 seconds p.m. That's precisely when that happened. Now, when you look at the transcripts, you'll notice that once that transfer is made, there's a big blank. There's nothing that takes place. There's no communication, radio communication at all, apparently, between air traffic control and the airliner. That goes on for 13 minutes and 59 seconds. Then what happens is that at 8.13 and 14 seconds, at 8.13 and 14 seconds, then all of a sudden, the radar man controlling Sector 5 airspace takes over the jet. So Sector 5 airspace, and I know this is complicated, but this is, this is important information. So for 13 minutes and 59 seconds, there's nothing at all, and there's a problem. And the reason that there's nothing on the transcripts and there's a problem is because, again, R2, sent the jet to the wrong frequency up to controller R16. What he was supposed to have done 
was send the airline to the person controlling sector four airspace. And on that night, the individual controlling sector four airspace and sector five airspace were one and the same. It's a gentleman named Cliff Ammerman. I know Cliff Ammerman quite well. I have talked with him at length about this stuff. In fact, I actually just spoke with him a couple of days ago because I wanted some clarity with respect to some of this stuff. Interestingly, Cliff Ammerman was never interviewed by the FBI. No explanation for that in my mind. So what happened here is that the jet was transferred over from R2 to R16 by mistake. And when the pilots presumably contacted the new air traffic controller, that new air traffic controller, R16, has no idea who these people are, what's going on, nothing at all. Because, you know, the jet at this point is at 10,000 feet. And remember, R16 is crawling, controlling airspace 24,000 feet or above. So he's not even on the, his radar screen. The jet's not even on the radar screen. So obviously there was some confusion. There was a lot of confusion on the part of the air traffic controller and also the pilots to some degree because they're not, you know, they're not exactly sure exactly what's going on because the handoff was done incorrectly. And it took ultimately 13 minutes and 59 seconds before it was ultimately all ironed out, before the air traffic controller finally understood what happened and what the mistake was and also understood that this was a special case, that the airliner 305, Flight 305, was going to be capped at 10,000 10, feet in altitude, which again is highly unusual. Most of the time airliners just go up to a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet and that's it. But again, this was a unique situation and it lends itself to problems occurring. So once 13, 813, uh, 14 rolls around, 8, 13, 14 rolls around, then R5, everything gets situated in, and the uh, R5, the controller Cliff Ammerman, R5, who's controlling that airspace, takes over and manages the jet. And just so you know, Cliff Ammerman, who was controlling Sector 4 airspace and Sector 5 airspace, was controlling airspace that was from 10,000 feet up to 24,000 feet. So Cliff Ammerman is the person who controls 10,000 to 24,000, and that's why he was supposed to have been handed the jet from R2 uh, at 759, but the, the mistake was made. Cliff Ammerman obviously finally starts communicating with Flight 305. He does this for uh, several minutes, and it's important to note that in addition to handling Flight 305, the Skyjacked airliner, Cliff is also responsible for managing and handling the two Air Force chase planes, F-106 chase planes that came out of McCord Air Force Base, as well as a T-33 Oregon Air National Guard chase plane that came out of Portland International Airport. So Cliff is handling the hijacked airliner, the two Air Force chase planes, and the one Air National Guard chase plane. And Cliff told me that as he's communicating with the uh, chase planes, and again, nobody can see anything. They're in the soup, it's dark, so it's, there's no eye to eye, there's no visual contact with the Skyjacked airliner. They just know he's out there somewhere, and they're just kind of following the jet as they're told to follow the jet. So Cliff Ammerman told me that uh, this got to be sort of problematic for him. And the reason why is because when he was contacting or communicating with the chase planes to relay information and so forth, he wasn't certain whether or not D.B. Cooper was actually in the cockpit of the Skyjacked airliner and whether or not he could actually overhear the conversations that were taking place between the air traffic controller, Cliff Ammerman, and the chase planes. So what Cliff would end up having to do is stand up, go to a certain panel, toggle a switch so it would shut off the transmission with the airliner so he could safely communicate with the chase planes and he knew for sure that the airliner wasn't hearing any of this stuff. Then when he wanted to, to communicate with the airliner, he would toggle back and he could communicate with the airliner. And he said it was very labor intensive and it got to be a problem. 
So what he ended up doing uh, about, I want to say it was probably about 16 or 17 minutes after finally getting control of the airliner, is he actually decided to hand off the airliner to the to control of the airliner to the individual who was controlling sector six airspace. I know this is a lot of sectors here. Sector six airspace was airspace that was from ground level up to again, about 10,000 feet. So Cliff Ammerman handed control of flight 305 off to the controller for sector six for R6. And it's R6 who took over controlling flight 305 then Cliff Ammerman could just deal specifically with the chase planes. So it's very interesting to note that that problem, that 13 minutes and 59 seconds of gap where there's nothing there, where there was this error and there was this miscommunication between the air traffic control and the pilots and everything else. It just so happens that that is precisely the time frame that D.B. Cooper actually jumped from the jet. And the pilots actually did, one of the pilots actually did make a comment to air traffic control at the time D.B. Cooper jumped because when D.B. Cooper jumped, it caused the air stairs to slap back up into the bottom of the fuselage and it created kind of a popping sensation in their ears. So they speculated, they thought Cooper must have just jumped and uh, the, the pilot, a gentleman named Bill Radicek, and I, Bill Radicek, and I've also talked with Bill Radicek and he's told me this himself. He said it was at that point that he commented to air traffic control that, hey, you may wanna mark this spot on your maps. I do believe our friend just took leave of us. Now, that's great information to have. It'd be wonderful to go back and look at the ATC transcripts and see precisely when that comment was made by Bill Radicek, the pilot, and then we could identify specifically, precisely when D.B. Cooper jumped. But the problem is, is there's nothing in the transcripts. That comment is not in the transcripts. And the reason why that's not in the transcripts is because remember it was during this time that there was that mishap, that miscommunication, the jet was actually communicating with the wrong air traffic controller. Again, control, talking with the gentleman who was controlling sector 16 airspace. And unfortunately, when the radio communications was later transcribed, whoever transcribed the radio communications did not bother to look into the radio communications for the person controlling sector 16, obviously because sector 16 was from 24,000 feet and above. So per, apparently the person who was transcribing never realized the mistake that was made. Therefore, when that person was listening in on the radio transcripts, they heard nothing but just dead airspace for 13 minutes and 59 seconds until the matter was finally resolved by ATC and basically the communication was back up and running. So D.B. Cooper got lucky. D.B. Cooper got very lucky in the sense that he happened to jump during that period of time. It's also very interesting to note that it's during the time of that transfer at 7.59 and 15 seconds from R2 to R16, it's during that time of transfer there that where you see a separation between the FBI's version of the flight path and my theorized version of the flight path, which again we call the Western flight path. I do not believe it's coincidence that the two flight paths start to separate at that moment, at the exact moment, at the exact time when that handoff was made between R2 and ultimately R16, and that all the problems and everything related to that uh, just happened to fall right then at the point where there's some separation in the flight path. So I know that's very complicated and I apologize for that. I'm trying to think of the simplest way to describe it, but let's call this part one of explaining the anatomy of the error that was made in actually penciling out the flight path, the path that the jet took, and ultimately the error that was made in determining where D.B. Cooper 
actually jumped. All right, folks, again, that's all I have for you today. I'll have a couple more videos coming up over the next couple of weeks here, a few weeks here, as I'll continue to sort of unfold this anatomy of the mistake and uh, get to the bottom of where D.B. Cooper actually jumped, at least where Eric Cooper's D.B. Cooper actually jumped. All right, folks, again, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to shoot me an email to eric at ericulis.com. Until next time, as always, folks.